Grab your Bibles, turn with me to, to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. Now, we are going to get out of Acts chapter 2, I promise you. Um, but there's just so much in those first two chapters of Acts. Often we'll, we'll do verse by verse preaching. And uh, what I just felt for this series this fall is, um, is uh, we don't really have an end date set yet. Because I just really feel like the Lord wanted us to study not so much verse by verse, but what, what does it look like to be a Jesus-centered, spirit-filled church? What does that look like? How, how is the Lord, um, how, how did the New Testament church come about to be that? And so open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. I'd encourage you to grab the notes in front of you and, and we'll jump in. I, again, I, this is something new for me. I don't usually do this, but I'm going to tell you. This is going to be our goal is I'm going to, at the end of our service, I'm going to invite as many of you that are willing, like we did a couple weeks ago, as many of you that are willing, I'm going to invite you to come forward, and we're just going to have a little prayer time. We're going to have us a prayer meeting before you leave today, so the preacher is going to go a little bit shorter so that you don't get nervous. Someone's going to beat you to rulies. Just relax. Just rest. Just, just rest. Let the Baptists and the, and, the, and the missionary church people, let them get through rulies, and then you can get there. They still have food for you. But this is, I, I want you to be prepared. The end of the service today, we're going we're gonna to touch heaven. We're going to touch, uh, touch God through our prayers. So thinking about uh, this message, I found this thought from J.B. Phillips. Some of you uh, may even know the Phillips version of the Bible. I'm not saying it's the best. All I'm saying is uh, J.B. Phillips, he worked on this. And I don't know if you've ever um, taken the New Testament Greek and turned it into a version of the Bible. Have you ever done that before? <clears throat> I didn't think so. Um, so that, but that's really what, what happened. Can you just imagine, in order to do that, you need to have such a grasp on the Greek language itself, not to mention to understand the Greek, the biblical Greek and, and all the, what, not just what could they be saying, but what were they saying in that context? And then to try to put that in modern day language. So someone asked him, it took him 14 years to do the New Testament, 14 years. What, what do you remember most? What, what was the thing that, that you kept uh, coming to when you, when you were studying, you just, you'd go back to it. You'd go back to it. And this is what he said. It'll be on the screen. He kept returning to the book of Acts and its portrait of the infant church. He says, the sick are not merely prayed about, said Phillips. They're healed. Often suddenly and dramatically, human nature is changed. The fresh air of heaven blows gustily through these pages. The early church lived dangerously, but never before has such a handful of people exerted such widespread influence. To put it shortly, the lasting excitement which follows the reading of the book is this. The thing works. Oh, I love that. In fact, I made it the title of my message. You can see at the top of my notes. The thing works. When, when, when God led the, the disciples and the apostles, and as we see this laid out in the book of Acts, we see that the way God orchestrated things, it works. The thing works. They're Jesus-centered. You don't have to go any further than Acts chapter 2. And you can see this message that Peter was preaching and uh, over and over and over again, he mentions Jesus, 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 the one that you put on the cross, Jesus, 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 completely Jesus-centered. That continues all the way through, so much so that they devoted themselves. One of the things that they devoted themselves was what? The, the, to the breaking of bread, to the idea of communion, to the idea that Jesus is at the center of it all. They devoted themselves to that. They were Jesus-centered, what he did for them on the cross. Why is this so important? Yes, clothe the naked. Yes, go ahead and let's start some schools. Yes, let's feed the hungry. But the most important thing is, do they know Jesus? Are we presenting Jesus? Are we taking Jesus? Are we taking the gospel to them? And them being this community, them being this nation, them being the nations around the world. Man, Jesus-centered. 
How did they do that? It wasn't just Jesus centered. It was spirit filled, spirit empowered. And we've talked a lot about this already, but can I, can I just ask you, you know, in Acts chapter two, we see the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter eight, it happened again. In Acts chapter 10, it happened again. In Acts chapter 19, it happened again. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Have you been baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit? At salvation, the Holy Spirit comes and resides in us. There's no question about it. You have the Holy Spirit. But the question that they had, and the question I have for you today, is have you received that second work, that infilling, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that has this, it's the same Holy Spirit, but a different work? This is an empowering work. Have you received that? In fact, if you'd say, yeah, I've received that. In fact, I've had some of the same phenomena that they saw in the book of Acts. Let me ask you this, though. Are you living in that? Are you? Because I think it's Ephesians chapter uh, uh, 5, verse 18. It says this. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The idea here is this. Be continually, keep being filled. Keep being filled. I'm not asking if you had a one-time experience with God where you know you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was amazing. I had an experience like that. I'm, I'm, asking, I'm, a, I'm, asking, I'm asking this. Are you continually being filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Do you have the power that he promised us? And you shall receive, Acts 1-8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Let me tell you something about that power. It's power for whatever you got. What is it you need? You see, when my kids were little, I needed wisdom and power to know how to lead them. And, and as my kids got older, I needed wisdom. And it was different. It was different. But I still need power and wisdom. When, when my kids move out of the house, I needed wisdom and power of how I can be a father to them in that season of life. I need power for all things. What is it you need power for? The idea of that word power is, is whatever it is you need. The dunamis is there. That's a Greek word. The, 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 it's there for you, whatever power you need. And most importantly, the power to share the gospel, the power to point others to Jesus. So think about how ingenious that was. I mean, just think about that. The, the, God is sending, the Holy Spirit of God is wanting to not just come in you at salvation, but come on you to empower you to live and to serve like Jesus. Do you, do you look, at the, look at the lives of Jesus and look at the lives of the apostles then in the book of Acts and you see how they healed the sick. You see how they had words of wisdom. I think about the woman at the well. Jesus met this woman at the well. How did Jesus know that, that this, this, uh, this gal um, had been married so many times and he just pretty much read her mail. Okay, let's stop. Yes, I understand he's God, but I can tell you exactly how. There was a word of wisdom that came to Jesus. He had never met that lady before, but he knew it. And it's, it's what we see, I believe, even when we get to Acts chapter three. There was some kind of a spiritual gift in part. Silver and gold, we don't have. Peter and John, silver and gold, we don't. This guy, this lame man sitting outside the gate, he's saying alms, alms. I mean, he's looking for money. And they come upon, and Peter and John, they're just like, well, no, 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 no. You need something more than, than what's in my pocketbook here, what's in my wallet. You need to be healed. And a, a gift of faith spiritual gift of faith, some kind of a spiritual gift just began to move inside of it and said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, I'm going to give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up. Do you know, God wants to empower every single one of us to do the stuff. God wants to empower this whole church to do the stuff. The Holy Spirit outpouring, the Holy Spirit moving isn't just for pastors and apostles and teachers and evangelists and missionaries. It's for all of us. God wants to empower you. Are you hungry for that? Do you want that? This was, do you remember in, in, in Acts chapter 1 verse 4? 
Um, it actually says, which you have heard me speak about. The Father's going to send you the Holy Spirit, which you've heard me speak about. Let's just remember, it, the Holy Spirit didn't just all of a sudden show up in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit was even there all the way back in Genesis. And you go all the way through the Gospels, Jesus kept talking about it. In fact, in, in John uh, chapter 16, verse 7, it says, But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Who's the counselor? That's the Holy Spirit. He was going to send the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I got to go so the Holy Spirit can come on you, can come on you, pour out on you. Although Jesus himself departed, God became present in each one of us, making his activity in the world more widespread than ever before. So now I want to zero in on one, just with the rest of our time here, I just want to real quick just hit this one thought, one idea. When, when you look at the, the New Testament church, a Jesus-centered, spirit-filled church, what does that look like? It's a, it's a spirit-led church. I want to talk to you about being led of the Holy Spirit. I want you to see it in Scripture, and then we're going to pray it at the very end of this service. The leading of the Holy Spirit. As you read carefully through the book of Acts, you'll notice every major decision of this young church was made with what? The leading of the Holy Spirit. Some theologians have even suggested it, it shouldn't be the Acts of the Apostles for a name of this book. It should be the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because I think it's over like 50 times the word Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit is, is talked about in the book of Acts. And, and this is exactly uh, why we're studying this. And this is why we want to see this. The power of the Holy Spirit was leading them, leading them. You can even just go to Acts chapter 2. You don't have to turn there just yet. But, but when you look at that message again, you see, in fact, I, I think it's interesting. Uh, Henry Jacobson, put that on the screen, will you? This is what he said about this. He, he, Peter, had no sermon notes in Acts chapter 2, no sermon notes. But he had two things that were infinitely more important. He had something to say, and he had the power of the Spirit. <laughs> and, and as he had something to say, and he had the power of the Spirit, What happened? What, what happened to all those he was preaching to in Acts chapter 2? They were cut to the heart, the Bible says. And they were like, what must we do to be saved? Where do we go from here? How do we respond? And he said, you know what you need to do? It's in Acts chapter 2. He says, you need to repent of your sins. And then you need to be water baptized. And then pray and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit you see that pattern throughout the book of Acts. But you, I, what I want you to see in Peter's message this time, though, is just how he was led of the Holy Spirit. He brought in the story of Joel. You see, all of these Jews of the time, they would have gone to synagogue and they would have heard the prophecy of Joel in the Old Testament, the book of Joel. They would have studied that, would have known that. that in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. I mean, Joel prophesied what they saw in Acts chapter 2. He brought in David and he talked about David and, and he's connecting all these dots so that these people could grasp just as he's led of the Holy Spirit. And that's why I'm throwing my notes away from, no, I'm just joking. I'm holding on to them. Not as good as he is, but um, I, I, I want you to get this leading of the Holy Spirit. Let's zero in on this. In fact, I want you to sh show you just a couple, couple places. Let's just think about Philip. Grab your Bibles, flip a couple pages over to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, there's this dude called Philip. In Acts chapter 8, um, specifically verse 26, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Verse 27, so he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of, of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home was sitting in this chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. Look at verse 29. I think it should be on the screen. The spirit told Philip, spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? And Philip asked, uh, Philip asked, how can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Jump to verse 34. 
34, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture, told the good news about Jesus. Even the Old Testament speaks of Jesus. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down in the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. <laughs> so they went down to the water uh, one got out, one just was gone. We'll talk about that again someday. But notice, he was led of the Spirit. And you think about the, uh, the fact that, uh, I don't think there's any coincidences for those of us who follow Christ. I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in divine appointments. I believe as, as you're following God, the Holy Spirit is leading you, guiding you. And I want to ask you something. The Spirit, in verse 29, told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Do you think the Holy Spirit could lead you in the same way today? Sure he can. I, I'm sure he leads a pastor or someone important like that. You know, pe- people that are, um, you know, spiritual. Really, I'm talking really, really spiritual people. I'm not the most spiritual, but I'm sure other really spiritual people. He would, no, he, he wants to lead all of us. And I, I don't want to demean the office of deacon in any way, but can I just tell you, Philip's office, Acts chapter 6, it was a deacon. What was a deacon to do? In that situation, Acts chapter 6, first couple verses, it tells you, it, the widows, some of the widows, it looked like was, were being over, overlooked and they weren't getting uh, uh, help or food or whatever. And so they, let's get some, some men who are full of the spirit and wisdom and let's put them in the office of this new, newly formed office of deacon and let's have them take care of the widows and look so that the others, the other disciples and the apostles could focus on uh, studying scripture and prayer and those type of things. So I'm not demeaning the office of deacon, but I'm telling you, he's, Philip, in essence, was just an everyday Joe. He was a, he was a guy like, uh, like anyone here today. And do you know that many believe that this Ethiopian eunuch that he, he ministered and encountered um, uh, and, and, and what happened, as we see right here in Acts chapter 8, led to the gospel first penetrating and spreading across the continent of Africa, all because someone followed the leading of the Holy Spirit. I mean, just think about that. As, as, think about the north, northern part of Africa, Egypt, and, and you just, just go out here, all the way across, all the way over to Morocco. We have missionaries right now that are in that whole area. We have one coming in November that's, that's headed headed to uh, Morocco, and, and we already have some that are there planting churches. We have, a, we have a missionary in Morocco right now, northern Africa, that's just going gangbuster, starting churches all over in the Muslim world. And, and do you know who first started planting those seeds? It's very likely it was this Ethiopian eunuch. And as you, as you just let that sink in, it's like, here's a deacon taking care of the widows, and on the side, he's just led of the Holy Spirit. Just led of the Holy Spirit. Never went to seminaries, cemetery. Never went to any kind of a Bible college. He never, and, but he's, just, he's led of the Holy Spirit. And you see that possibly that one conversation, led of the Holy Spirit with the Ethiopian eunuch, helped to bring the gospel message to the northern Africa and maybe even eventually the whole continent. What's your point, Scott? This is what my point is. John Hunter most of you have no idea who that guy is. But in the 1980s, John Hunter moved from Texas to Indiana, and he started going to the church that I grew up in. And John Hunter was never a pastor. I don't think he ever preached a message. But he had a passion to help students, teenagers, understand and memorize and learn the Word of God. And he teamed up with our youth pastor, and for year, I like 20, 25 years, John Hunter in the position, he, he was never a pastor. He, he was a deacon for off and on from time to time at our, at our church officially. But he was just a guy, just, I'll let the Lord use me. And, you know, even just this past week, someone pulled out something from those years way back in the 80s and the 90s. And I remember studying scripture with you, John, and they put it on social media. And I was reminded of that as preparing this message. You know, there's John poured into many of us students, many, many, many high school students, many middle school students, poured the word of God into them, helped them grasp it. And there are missionaries today on the field in Africa that John was a piece of getting them there. There are, there are people that John poured into that are in ministry in Illinois 
Illinois, uh, in, in Missouri, in um, Indiana, um, in Ohio, in Michigan. There are people all over just because a guy was just like, I'm just going to be led of the Holy Spirit. Just an everyday, everyday fella. He worked for Dometic. Some of you know the, the company Dometic. Worked there for years. That's what brought him from Texas to Indiana. But uh, what's your point? When, my, my point is this. There's John Hunter sitting all over this room right now, and some of you are just untapped. You're just untapped. You think, I'm not spiritual enough. I'm not good enough. I, I'm not led of the Spirit enough. I'm not, oh, no, 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 no. Let me tell you, let's, let's come this morning. Let's get full of the Spirit of God. Let's ask him. It's like, God, I don't even know what I'm praying for, but I want it. I mean, do you think in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, they had been praying for 10 days? What were they praying uh, they got an email, maybe. Who knows? Maybe that would tell them. <laughs> in Acts chapter 2, when it finally fell, the Holy Spirit fell, they had been praying for 10 days. What were they praying? I don't see anywhere in Scripture where it says them, uh, for directions on exactly this is what you should pray for. Here's your prayer list. Here's your prayer guide. Other than just, okay, we're, we're trusting the Holy Spirit's going to fall on us, whatever that means. Uh, We're going to pray for the promise of the Father. Send it. I mean, after a while, it's like, what else are we going to pray? But they kept praying for 10 days. And in a few moments, we're going to come forward. We're going to pray. What should we pray, Pastor? I don't know. But pray that God would send his power on us and that he would specifically, that power would lead us like God and the Holy Spirit led Philip. Let's go to Barnabas and Saul. In Acts chapter 13, just a couple chapters over. You guys are doing good. I hear the Bible the Bible page is turning. I'm not saying you can't read scripture on your phone, but then we also hear when your fantasy football trade goes through. <laughs> Acts chapter 13. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Saul, just a reminder, a couple of verses later, I think it's verse 9 or somewhere like that, it actually says Saul, also known as Paul. So Saul and Paul, same dude. Verse 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, the, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. I, I can't help but to just say one thing. If anyone ever comes up to you and says, I feel like I got a word from the Lord for you, I just feel like God's laid something hard to share with you. Um, it's always wise to take that time, verse three, fast and pray. Always pray yourself. Always take time yourself and say, okay, God, if that's from you, then help me to know. Um, uh, just because someone has a word for you, which I, I, we want to see that happen. That ought to happen in our church. There ought to be words that people share. But you take that then and you present it to the Lord. Say, Lord, I just want you to confirm in my heart that this is from you. That's what we see here. Set apart for me, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. The Holy Spirit said, how did he say that? I'm guessing it was a prophetic word. Holy Spirit moved on somebody. They just spoke it out. Maybe uh, they they didn't remember who said it, so they didn't record. This person said, but the Holy Spirit, I I don't know as if it was an audible voice. Thus said the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. I'm not so sure that's what it was, but I wasn't there. You weren't there. We don't exactly know. But And after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them out. The Holy Spirit was leading them. This was the first missionary journey of many that Paul would take. Spirit-led, spirit-directed. The Holy Spirit was leading them. Well, I'm, I'm glad to see this because we need Holy Spirit-led missionaries. But why would we not think then that the Holy Spirit couldn't be just as active in your workplace? As as you're sitting in your uh, business meeting, as you're sitting in in the meeting with uh, all the heads and you're talking about the direction the business is going or how, uh, have you ever taken time? You say, well, if I took time to pray in in the midst of a meeting like that, people would just freak out. It's a blah, okay, well, you know, I, I'm in a lot of meetings now. I have over the years serving in different committees and places in, in town that are outside of the church that almost every time there's a prayer meeting, but it's a one-man prayer meeting with myself. I'm walking in there saying, Lord, help me not to say anything stupid. Um, help me to be uh, wise as a serpent and harmless as doves. I pray that all the time. 
Lord, as we're, as we're talking about something, as I'm going into this meeting for the town or whatever it may be, I'm, I'm praying, I'm asking the Lord for wisdom and his leading and guidance and what I would say, how I would do it. All that just to say, I just, I just, we need to get past the idea that the spiritual gifts and the way the Holy Spirit moved in the, in the book of Acts is only for Sunday morning church. It's for everyday life. It's for all of us. It's for every day in your parenting, in, in your workplace, at your, at your school, whatever it looks like, the Holy Spirit wants to lead in our town, in our county, in our nation, in, our, in every country of the world. We call upon God. He will lead us. He will direct us. Let's get so full of the Holy Spirit that it's just natural. It's like, okay, Holy Spirit, what needs to happen here? Okay, Holy Spirit, show us. What, I, think, I think some of the, the, the greatest ideas that you could ever have for your small business might yet be seen. What if we took that time to set aside and say, Lord, give me wisdom. Show me. God, I, I, I've done all I can to my ability now, fill me with your spirit and lead me as you did Barnabas and Saul. Let's keep going. Another one, the church council meeting. Could the Holy Spirit lead a church council meeting? Could the Holy Spirit lead during a church business meeting? I say yes. We see it in, in Acts chapter 15. Here was the issue. The issue was there were many Gentile coming into the church. Gentiles were getting saved. And there's some legalistic Jews said if a Gentile comes in, gets saved, the Mosaic law would say, the law of the Old Testament says that they need to be circumcised. And so there's this big debate. Do we have to circumcise the Gentiles or not? And then do we have to, how are, how are we saved? What did, did I say something wrong? <laughs> did it just come out wrong? I'm going to go back and listen to it. Let's move on. So, so, so you got, you, you got this, you got this situation here where it's like, even yet, get beyond the circumcision thing, get to Mosaic law. How are we saved? There were Jews that, that were very religious and they're like, you can't be saved without following the Mosaic law, like the, the, uh, uh, the law of the Old Testament. And so are we saved by grace through Christ or are we saved by grace through Christ and the Mosaic law, keeping both of those? And so they had this big, huge church business meeting where all the bigwigs came and they're gathering together and they're having this big discussion. And, um, and this is where we see it land in Acts chapter 15, verse 28. In fact, I look up here on the screen if you can. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You're to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual morality. You'll do well to avoid these things. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. You surround yourself with people of uh, known for their wisdom, godly wisdom, and full of the Holy Spirit. And even yet, there's going to be times where you, I don't know what we should do here. Well, here's the question. What seems good? What seems like a good godly thought here? Again, what seems like godly wisdom here? And it seemed good to the Holy Spirit in us. Do you know, one time Megan and I, this is like 20 years ago, we were looking for a house. And we found a house. And overall, it had, it had some things that we didn't even dream that we could have in our house. It was cool. It's like, oh, this is great. But then there's a couple of things it's like we could deal with. And so we were just, and we were contemplating buying this house or not. And, and at that point, we had, it, we had the money. It was kind of at the top of our range, but we had the money. We could buy this house. All we were waiting on was the realtor to bring us the paperwork, sign our lives away <laughs> for that mortgage and, and the sale of the house. And, and that's all it was. And you know what? As much as it, it, it so, it, it was, it, I just couldn't get peace about it. And eventually, of course, Megan and I, we talked about it. It's like, Megan, how are you feeling? She's like, well, how are you feeling? It just kind of went back and forth. It's like, I just have, I, I, I would love to live in that house. It's got a pool. It's got these things. It's got, that would be a great house. But I just have no peace about it. I have no peace at all. And she said, neither do I. So we let it go. We ended up buying another house with no pool. But it had everything else we needed for the time and we've lived in it for a long time now. Um, but, but this is what I want you to get. 
was that a real spiritual decision where we lived? I mean, did we over-spiritualize a decision about a house? I don't think so. I think that the Holy Spirit wants to lead you, wants to guide you. And sometimes you're not going to see the, the word in the sky, thus saith the Lord, go east, <laughs> or whatever it may be. You're not going to have someone come up. You're dying. You're like, we got to go to church Sunday morning because I'm hoping somebody's going to have a prophetic word and just pull me aside. You just dream of that. It's like someone saying, i got a word for you, sister. I just want to tell you, blah, blah. You're just, I'm trusting God's going to do that, and nothing happens. And it's just like, well, there's times when the Holy Spirit's going to lead you like they did these dudes. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. It's like, we've got to make a decision so we're not going to force the decision, but we're going to trust the Holy Spirit. And just when we have peace about something or we don't have peace about something, often the, the Holy Spirit will lead us that way. How about this, though? This is the point I want you to get. Let's just get full of the Holy Spirit. Let's just get filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Let's be that kind of a church. Let's be that kind of a family. Let's be that kind of a people. Let's get so full of the Holy Spirit that we're, we're constantly just led of the Holy Spirit. You can see it in the life of Paul in Acts chapter 16 as well. I'm just going to skip over that because I think we're there. How about in your life? Let me ask you something. Do you need more of the Holy Spirit's power leading you? This is what we see in Acts. A Jesus-centered, Spirit-filled, and led church. And God wants to lead you. If you turn your notes over on the back side there, there's a couple of empty spots. Let me fill those in for you, and then we're going to pray. Let's conclude with two thoughts on these New Testament believers, because I just want to make sure some of you are like, I'll never be as spiritual as those people I read about in the Bible. I'll never be, I'll never be, I'll never be, I'll never be. I'm not asking how spiritual are you. I'm asking you this. Have you repented of your sins? Have you been baptized in water? If you haven't yet, it's coming up. Let's get you baptized in water. And have you prayed and asked the Holy Spirit just to come and fill you? Because I want to be led in the same way that Philip was. I want to be led in the same way that others do. Let me just remind you something about the early disciples. Here it is. The people God chooses to empower and lead are not perfect performers, but dependent followers. Fill that in. Dependent followers. I don't want a church. I, 22 years ago when we moved back to Middlebury and, and we started Pathway, it wasn't because we had all the answers. You know? I, 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 I was talking with some, um, my aunt and uncle who are missionaries, Del and Jeannie Penner in, in Germany. And I remember them saying they had like, I should know this. I think it's five kids. I think I have five cousins from them. But anyhow, so, so um, they had all these kids and all the German people were like, why are you having so many kids? You can't afford that. You can't afford And so what's their answer? Their answer is, man, it's not what can we afford as much as, we, they're a blessing. They're not a, we're just trusting God will provide. And, and I'm not saying everyone should have 19 kids and get a TLC show. I'm not saying that. But at the same time, there is, a, there is a point where I don't know what the future holds, but I'm dependent on the Holy Spirit. I'm dependent on the Lord. I'm trusting God's going to be there. He's going to lead us. He's going to direct us. Get so full of the Holy Spirit. Let him depend on him. Second thing is this. The plan God honors is not complicated, but simple. <laughs> Just get full of the Holy Spirit. I know it seems so simple. And I know there's the fruit of the Holy Spirit and speaks to your, your godly character. And there's more to obviously being a follower of Christ. But I'm just telling you, in this season, this is what God's saying to us as a church. Get full of the Spirit of God. Get full of the Holy Spirit. Ask not just a, God, come, give me an Acts chapter 2 experience. I'll take all that you got for me. And that some people get freaked out about speaking in tongues and prophesying through tongues and those things. Let me just tell you, don't eat, just go after God and know it's going to come and it's going to be a blessing. Let the Holy Spirit fill you and then keep getting filled. Don't stop. Some of us, we have plan A and God reveals plan A and you know it requires trust and obedience and you're like, could I find a plan B? I feel a little more comfortable with plan B because I can see how plan B can, and God says, no, plan A is the best. Trust me in this. Put your faith in me. Rest in me. I'll lead you. Stop trying on your own and start trusting. We need the Holy Spirit, church. Come on, stand with me, will you?